Welcome to Describing Histograms. Our objectives today are to describe a histogram in terms of socks, and that's an acronym that helps you to remember the different ways that you need to describe a histogram. More specifically, that would be the shape of the histogram, whether there's any outliers, you would be looking at the center and how spread out the data is. So first we're going to look at shape of histograms. We're going to look at three very common shapes. And there are many different shapes, but these are the three most common. Now notice on the first shape, it looks very symmetrical, right? If you draw a line, it would come up, come over, and we could say that, you know, it's almost even. We've got this blob in the middle, and then we've got, you know, about the same height here, the same frequency of data here, it comes down pretty evenly. If the left side looks like the right side, we can say that this is symmetrical. And that is a normal type of distribution, but it's very symmetrical. It looks about the same on each side. And this one here on the left, this one's a little bit different. If you notice that the data, if you're looking at it, we still have this glob here in the middle but then we start to step down a little bit less frequency, a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less. Um, and then we have a tiny bit over here. What we call this is positively skewed. This is called positively skewed. Okay, so you've had a little bit of experience with skewed data. Anytime you don't have a symmetrical shape, most likely you're going to have a skewed shape. So in this case, the easy way to remember that it's positively skewed is to put yourself on the tallest hump right up here. And then think of yourself as going down a ski run or, or a hill or something like that. Um, and you would actually go this way down the hill and up, right? This is how you would ski. So think about the direction you are going here. You are going in the positive direction. And I get that from, if you were to have a number line, right, and you would have zero right here in the middle, and then you'd have some marks here, like one, two, and three, and then on this side, you would have negative one, negative two, and negative three. So if I look at which direction I'm going, I'm going towards the positive numbers. I'm getting bigger on the number line, and this is why we call this positively skewed. So do the same thing here for this one on the right. If you look at this and you look at being right here on top, which way would you go down if you were skiing or you were sledding down a hill? Well, you would go this way, all the way down and out. And if you'll notice which direction we're going, we're going towards the negative numbers on the, neg on the number line. So in this case, we are considered negatively skewed. And again, we have many other shapes of data, but these are the three very common ones. You have a symmetrical, you have a positively skewed type, and a negatively skewed. Okay, so that's shape. Let's look at outliers. So if I'm looking at this data on the top, this is a histogram of money spent on drinks. So here we have our intervals. And this is the amount of money rounded to the nearest dollar. And then always again on histograms, the left side is the frequency. How many people spent this much money? Notice that most people spent, and this represents right here about 19 people, right? 19 people spend somewhere, I don't know, in the zero to $10 range maybe, I'm not exactly sure, they don't have it completely labeled here what the intervals are. And we could probably calculate it if this is 75, it looks like these go by about 75. But the most majority of the people don't spend very much money on soft drinks. But then you have this one person here, it looks like the height of this interval here is one. So one person spent somewhere upwards of 400 to $425 um, per month on soft drinks. So this person drinks a lot of soft drinks. This person is not normal, right? It, he stands or she stands away from the data. So this right here, this is an outlier. 
And it's important to identify when you have outliers because outliers can impact other measures of data. For example, RR mean. It can impact that. It can impact standard deviation potentially, which we haven't quite yet talked about. But just identifying that here we have an outlier is what's important. Now if I were to look at the shape of this data, and here's my um, hill right up here. Think about how I'm going. I'm going down this way and out. So if you remember from previously, we would say that this is a positively skewed graph. Okay, let's move on to this one down here. So this is stock returns on Philip Morris's stock. This is the frequency and this is the monthly stock return. So if you look right here, not good. This is negative between negative 30 and negative 25. So in this interval, um, and this is a percent, so if you had purchased stock, you would have lost 25 to 30% here, but this only happened probably once, it looks like. If, if here is zero and here is five, this maybe only happened once. So the frequency of how often this happened has only been once. In fact, the majority of the time, right here, right, 30, 30 times or 30%, depending upon how they're measuring this frequency, the stock earned a rate of between zero and 5%. So somewhere in there. So pretty typical, not too bad. And then you can even look up here and say, well, five and 10% happened about half of the time and then it kind of tapers off from there. So this is almost a normal distribution. If you think about it, you have this big blob here in the middle, and then it almost tapers down about equally on either side. So it's pretty close to a normal or symmetric distribution, with the exception of this outlier. All right, so let's move on past outliers. So we have socks, we've gone from shape to outliers, and now we're going to go to center. So let's look at the center of our data. So what happens when we have skewed data? When we have skewed data, that means we have a lot of data out here, for example, on the right side, this right or positively skewed data, and it affects our mean and our median. Or if we have a lot of data out here pulling us to the left, or not even necessarily a lot, if we just have some significant lower numbers or we have some significant upper numbers, because actually most of the data is you know, right in here where our median is um, on both of these. But that can impact, like I said before, our mean. So let's actually first look at a symmetric distribution right here. If you have a symmetric distribution, the mean and the median are one and the same. If it's a perfectly symmetrical distribution right here, our mean and our median are right in the middle. And that makes sense because this is the middle of the data, so that's the median. Remember that the median does not actually measure values, it just measures placement. So whatever's right in the middle is your median. Well, it just happens to be that if your data is symmetric, then your mean will also be right in the middle. So if you didn't see a graph and you were just calculating the mean and you were just calculating the median, if they were both 10 or they were both 20 or 25 or whatever, you would know that my data is pretty symmetric looking if I were to graph it. So on the other hand, that brings us to right skewed and left skewed or positive and negative. Put a positive here and a negative here. So what happens when we have these outliers out here or these you know, significantly higher numbers out here? Think about what that does to your mean. If you have $1 and I have $3, the average of what we have is two dollars. But if somebody else came along and had fifty dollars, that would substantially change our average. That would make it in the twenties. Um, even though this data here, there's not very much of it, it's just so much higher that it, it changes where your mean is. So it does impact the mean. And if you'll notice that the mean has moved to the right as well. So if you have a right skewed or positively skewed data, your mean is going to move in that same direction. So your mean has been pulled to the right by some of these data out here that's an outlier or that's part of that tail. The opposite happens when you have a left skewed or negatively skewed distribution. Notice where our mean is here. So in this case, 
maybe you have $10 and I have $12 and the average of what we have is 11. So let's say somebody else came along and they only had $1. Well, that would, again, dramatically change our mean. It would lower it substantially due to this person here with the $1 or this person here with the $3 perhaps. So here's our mean. It is getting pulled to the left, just like at the term here, left skewed towards the negative side. It's getting pulled over here. So whenever we have skewed data, our mean does no longer line up with our median. In fact, it's pulled either to the left or to the right. And that's what we mean by center, analyzing where our center is. The median is still going to be in the center of the data, but the mean may no longer represent the center of the data. And that's important when you are analyzing what you have. All right, let's go on to our last concept for SOX, and that's spread of the data. And this is probably uh, one of the easier ones to visually look at when you have two graphs that you can compare. And really, this is just measuring our range. Um, we have some other measures of spread too, like the standard deviation or variance, but we are just going to look at for now just kind of the range and how spread out our data is to help us understand this. So if you look at this top graph, you know, we have data way out here at, at 1, and then we have data way down here at negative probably 0.25. So, you know, that's a pretty big range. It ranges from there to here, and we could subtract and calculate it. However, if we look at this data here, we really only range from about here, which is a positive 0.25, to maybe about here, which is a, oops, sorry, this one right here would be a negative 0.75. I think I said negative 0.25, but that's probably what this one is, 0.25, to a positive 0.25, versus this one, which is about 1, all the way down to negative 0.75. So you can look at the numbers, to see how spread out it is, or you can actually just look at the graph. If you'll notice this graph here has a lot more going from left to right, it's a lot wider, right? Versus this little one here, which is very narrow. The data is very close together, it's clustered together, whereas on this one, it's a lot more spread out. So one of the things you could think about for your upcoming assignment, because you will be collecting some more data is, is thinking about things that will give you data that is more spread out versus things that will give you data that's more clustered together. You know, if you're looking at finding the ages of everybody in your class, what would that be? Would that be very spread out or would that be very clustered together? So right now while you're in high school, it's probably going to be more clustered together. Everybody's going to be around 16, 17, 18. Whereas if you go to college and you take a class, potentially you could have 18 year olds in your class, but you could also have 45 year olds in your class. People go back to school. So that we're looking at, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about spread. All right, let's put everything together. Let's put our socks together to analyze this final graph. So remember that the first thing was shape. So let's look at our shape. And if you think about how to do that, again, plant yourself on the tallest portion and then which side would you go down if you were going down a ski run, for example? You would go this way. Down. So which direction is that? That's to the right, right? So this is right or positively skewed is the shape. Okay, so remember that we have our acronym SOX. So the second thing after S, this was our S, so shape is we have O, which stands for outlier. So do we have any outliers in this graph? And if you look right here, this is an outlier. So we know this is going to impact our mean or our average. So we do have an outlier. So now we've addressed S, we've addressed O, and we are now gonna address our C, which is our center. So for our C, well normally our center would be, you know, right in the middle, right in here somewhere. But we know that because our graph is positively skewed, it's pulling to the right, our center is also going to pull to the right. So our mean is going to be pulled somewhere here. And we'll just say that's the mean because we don't know what it is. 
compared to where our median would be, our median would be to the left of that. All right, we're almost done. Our final, final acronym is S for spreads. And it's hard to tell unless we compare with something else. But if we look at our numbers, and this is mortality rates um, post-surgical. So when people have surgery and they come out of the hospital, um, you know, how often do they, they die or not make it? And then these are the rates. So we are at zero, which is great. And it looks like 11 hospitals had zero. And we go all the way up to, I'm assuming this is in percentages. So we go all the way up to, with this outlier, if we pull that out, actually, we probably go closer to about 5%. So from zero to 5%, you know, it's hard to tell, but it seems to me like the data is somewhat spread out. Somewhat spread out. Um, and I say that just because in a situation like this, mortality rates, we would assume that they would be very low and not so high. And that seems, um, when you go all the way up to 5%, that, that seems like it's, it becomes pretty spread out. All right, and that concludes our lesson on describing histograms. So use the term socks to help you in describing the shape, whether there's any outliers. Looking at the center, where is the center? So in other words, where is the mean in relation to the median? And then finally, the spread. Estimate if you think the data is fairly spread out or, or very closely clustered together.